Welcome, welcome everybody. So we are live uh, on our YouTube page uh, today with uh, a very special guest that, as you know, is uh, uh, coming back to countless uh, conversations, let's say, for the second time. Um, we have been uh, so proud to have James already uh, in our podcast uh, now, almost one year ago. So, James, uh, thanks very much for, for, for coming back. If you want to just say hello to our listeners. Hello. This is, uh, I'm here in Palo Alto in the uh, NFX offices, and I'm very pleased to be with you guys. Thank you so much for the work that you do. Thank, thank you, James. It's, it's, I think it's also a great uh, feeling for some of our listeners to feel that they are inside the office of such a great, uh, uh, you know, uh, powerhouse in uh, in the in the conversation around uh, around the network effects marketplaces and so on uh, today we also have uh, with us uh, the uh, uh, my co-author let's say in this uh, research we are doing on growth the new landscape of growth manfredi sassoli so, manfredi if you want to say hello hi all good to see you i am in london at home Okay, that's great. Uh, so, um, as um, you may have noticed, I'm also at home in, in Italy, uh, as we are uh, living this strange here. So, uh, without further ado, I want to just uh, <laughs> use a couple of mi uh, minutes to introduce you to the conversation today. So, uh, so basically, this is the point. You know, we are really talking about uh, how we here at Boundless we see this new landscape of growth uh, unfolding, and you know, of course, James has been one of our sources uh, for for so many so long in this exploration. Uh, today, it's me, as I said, me and Freddy. Uh, co-authoring this research and uh, we will be hosting a series of webinars in the coming uh, weeks uh, and months and uh, James uh, is the first to attend our webinars and you will uh, uh, see more coming up. I will disclose a bit later on. Um, so uh, why this research? Essentially we are uh, considering that the topic of growth, uh, similarly to the topic of platforms uh, design and marketplace thinking, uh, it's pervasive. So this is a matter for everybody. It's not just a matter for specialists and, and you know, startup founders, uh, institutions, big corporates, small uh, design, um, design endeavors, social enterprises. Everybody needs to be able to master this practice. And so this is why we are trying to distill the uh, extensive body of knowledge knowledge that uh, of which of course uh, James is one of the biggest contributor with NFX uh, and trying to make it also easy and and and, and you know for people to navigate uh, through to, to the signal um, in terms of what happened so far we had uh, three blog posts uh, last one was released uh, just yesterday and uh, you can check it out on our on our blog and uh, now we are running the first uh, webinar uh, the agenda for today uh, is going to be um, basically uh, 30, 40 minutes of conversation with James. And then if you are interested, you can drop uh, questions on the YouTube channel. Uh, our uh, staff is uh, uh, trying to uh, moderate these questions and will surface the questions for us here uh, uh, in the final part of the, on the conversation. Uh, the uh, conversation today will, will be revolving around these four uh, topics. Uh, so basically, we're going to try to understand, you know, the, more generally the landscape, uh, the changes that have been, um, I would say, showing up in the last uh, uh, few years. Uh, and then uh, we're going to talk about the, how to drive growth strategically, uh, what is the role of uh, launching and, and achieving liquidity, which is, I think uh, one of the main, um, definitely the main problem now in the heads of uh, most of the founders. And uh, finally, we'll talk about economics, viability. Uh, all these things have changed a lot in the last uh, few years, I believe. And so um, James will help us probably to uh, really understand how these changes have been impacting this uh, very important industry. So I'm going to leave the floor um, for now to... Uh, to Manfredi, and I will be back for, with you in, in, a, in a few minutes. So, Manfredi, please, uh, you can go ahead. Great. So, uh, I think the first question on my mind, which I suspect is on everyone's mind, is really quite an obvious one in a way. So, as Simone was just saying, marketplaces are becoming more and more pervasive, and uh, you've been pretty much involved in the field over the past 
20 plus years. Um, we've seen horizontal marketplaces, vertical marketplaces, um, demand driven, supply driven, managed, non managed, um, and hybrids. Um, and we're also seeing disruptions within marketplaces that come generation one, two, three different areas. What I'm wondering is how does kind of somebody like you see the landscape and you know clearly NFX invests in network effect businesses or powered businesses. Um, has your high, kind of investment hypothesis changed uh, over the past two years, say? Uh, that's a good question. Uh, no, I, our thesis is still the same. The, the idea is that the <clears throat> internet has come along 25 years ago and enabled more network effects to be built. Network effects are such a defensible and value creating mechanism within businesses that we're just following that. And that's been our thesis since, since we began investing. And it's going to continue to be our thesis most likely for the next 20 years while I'm still uh, helping to run this place. And that's why we named the firm NFX for network effects. And, you know, marketplaces are, are just one of the type of network effects that we see. Um, so there are marketplaces, but then there's a marketplace network effect. And so there's a particular characteristic of that. And we, we track that, we analyze it, we look at it, and then we see where we can replicate it and help companies do better at adding that into their business. Um, and so you know, we've, we've only seen it accelerate. And what I will say is that I think we're just still at the beginning. We're just still at the beginning. There are still so many types of marketplaces that have yet to come into existence. We just published yesterday about enterprise gateway marketplaces, which are a, a new form that's gonna essentially turn our corporations inside out because the cost of communicating with people outside the firm is going to be cheaper and cheaper and cheaper than the cost of communicating inside the firm. And if you look at the theory of the firm, the reason the firm exists is because of the inexpensiveness, the lack of friction, the coordination that you get from being inside of one company. But what we're seeing with the advent of these enterprise gateway marketplaces, more it's, it's like a new way of outsourcing that's gonna be much more flexible, much more digitally driven and that's just beginning. And that's just one type. And we've got six or seven other types of marketplaces which are just beginning to emerge like market networks and other things. So it's we are, we are literally just at the beginning of this process where the whole world global economy is gonna be continually moved into digital, moved into marketplaces, moved into a place of flexibility and freedom and price discovery and lower costs and higher quality. And it's gonna, it's, it's just beginning. Awesome. And so, as you were saying, we have different types of marketplaces and, of course, different types of network effects. Um, and I believe you've listed up to 14 on your website. Is that the latest? It's 15. Yeah, we just we just the last 15, one was 15. the tribal network effect. Yeah, the tribal network right. effect was 15. Yeah. And at the same time, as I was saying earlier, we've seen kind of different generations of marketplaces um, disrupting each other. And so one might ask himself, you know, are network effects becoming more understood and therefore less defensible? Um, and you know, what are the implications? Um, are you kind of also looking at kind of businesses that maybe have weaker network effects but have other assets, other moats? Yeah. So, so no, I don't think network effects are becoming less defensible because I think it's just math. I think the math sustains. Do you have more people competing to build network effects? Yes. So the competition is getting better as more people understand it. But I got to tell you, so few people still understand network effects. Why is Poshmark only worth four or five billion dollars? Clearly, the market still doesn't understand network effect. The Poshmark network effects are just kicking in and they're mm -hmm. eight years into it. And if you look at a company like Fiverr, which started as a place to sell services for five dollars only, very narrow focus. Everyone was surprised that that thing even survived. And then they were, they were surprised when it went public for $600 million valuation. And then when it reached a $2.4 billion valuation, everyone was surprised again. And now it's worth about 10 billion and everyone's surprised. So I, I, I understand that there are very few people who are really studying these network effects and, 
but there's so few people who still understand them. So no, I don't think it's it's uh, they're less defensible at all. They're, you know, the more we learn about them, the more you can you can build real defensibility into your business. So I I still think you know at the end of my career, 30 years from now, I'm still going to be talking about this. I don't I don't think that changes. Now, can you augment the defensibility of a network effect that you have with other forms of defensibility? Sure. If you go to my if you go to the website and you read the article on defensibility. Um, uh, you know, it's the number one value creator for founders. We talk about the four major defensibilities, which are network effects and then embedding. And both of those are available to startups. And so those are the ones we, we focus on. Embedding is the idea of like when you embed software into an enterprise, they can't rip it out because it becomes part of their workflow. And so they, if you want to charge them 25% more next year, what are they going to do? The cost of ripping it out is much higher than paying you the 25%. So that's embedding. That's a good defensibility. And then you've got brand, which takes a while to build typically. Then you've got scale, which is something like an Amazon, where you know, the bigger you are, the lower your prices are, so everyone comes to you to buy, and and that's that's sort of a scale effect. Those those four are what's sort of left in terms of defensibilities in the digital world. Right before we had mm -hmm. defensibilities like I own the mine or I own the port, you know. Uh, but really, in the in the digital world, we're le we're left with these four, and mm -hmm. they reinforce each other. They absolutely reinforce each other. And and on our network effects map, we show you here are the the network effects. But then there's also embedding, there's scale, and there's brand. And you can see how companies can navigate the map to establish defensibility by augmenting. There's another thing we call reinforcement, where once you get one network effect, it's easier to build others on. And so we've got an article about you know network effects reinforcement, uh, where we use the analogy of the castle or whatever. People use the word moat, but we don't use that word um, because it's, it's just not the way it works. Mm -hmm. um, and we think it's deceiving. And so we, we use this. Other. So yeah, you absolutely can combine multiple networks and reinforcement, and you can combine other types of defensibility with a network of defensibility. Marcel, if I can add a, a quick, uh, quick uh, question, if you don't mind. Uh, so so uh, in, and what is in your, in your, uh, in your point of view, uh, the role of uh, trying to, try to ex ante, let's say, to the development of the strategy, to really understand the nature of the network. No, because uh, we know that uh, uh, this pattern now is available in many, many industries, you know, in many contexts, many economic contexts, let's say, everywhere, as you said. You know? So, so I, I th you know, we need to go deeper in understanding the relationship, the nature of the interaction, um, really how, for example, mechanisms such as trust building or, uh, you know, um, other, specific aspects that are related to the experience that we are designing uh, for the entities in the marketplace uh, influence uh, the capability that we will have in the future to drive growth. So essentially there is some strategic approach to growth that is not just hacking your way uh, to grow. So it's a great question, uh, Simone. And I, there's, there's two spectrums. There's one spectrum, which is sort of, let's have a good strategy. Let's think it through. Let's analyze it, all that. Um, and let's have a, a North Star that we, we always follow. And that can be very powerful. Having that North Star can be very powerful. But over intellectualizing it can paralyze teams. And then there's the other side, which is just do tactics. Just because the software makes it easy for you to iterate, just do tactics, look at the data, make a change, make a change, and see what works. Most of the successful businesses in the marketplaces area have been on this side of the spectrum. And our tendency as high IQ people, particularly those of us who come from academia and went to like all these schools which teach analysis, tends to make us think that we're gonna do better if we analyze more deeply rather than just take action and kind of jump around. And I guess the bigger mistake I see people make is on the side of overanalyzing and over strategizing. Now, I, I, there's a place for strategy for sure, but the mistake I see people make is over strategizing. Now, for me, strategy is a way of getting people to align around experimentation, all right? getting the everyone on the team to understand why are we doing these 
these experimentations. But I think we over strategize, particularly in places like New York and in London, where we've got all these incredibly smart people, where we are overbanked, we are over consulted. Everyone, you know, you know, we're, we're all trying to be like we're from Oxford and write some great treatise on some great intellectual thing. And we, we want to get validation from that. We want to get safety from that. We want to generate enough confidence from those words, from that strategy, so that we can do this other stuff. Because this is where the businesses are built. And so I think we should, I, I want to say to your, your, your community, I am advocating much more for the iterative, the tactical, because, but you, but you only, you're only going to be able to do it if you have the confidence to just, just do it. Right. And a lot of the strategy stuff and writing stuff down, it's, it's all about getting the courage to just start doing. So that's, that's my take on it. That's where I come from mm -hmm. as a practitioner, as a builder, as a product person who has now become an investor. That's where I live. Right. And mm -hmm. I think this uh, resonates, and then I will leave to you, Manfredi, but this resonates a lot with uh, um, the, you know, also what we have been uh, praising, you know, that to use the design tools as a way to align a team towards getting something to the market. All these experience that you want to pro prototype, you want to learn from the feedback. And sometimes people tend to, you know, be more uh, interested in the canvas than in the process that brings the team to the market, which is essentially what you need to focus on. But maybe before leaving back the floor to, to Manfredi, one provocation then. Uh, so when do you, uh, is there a way to understand strategically through analysis that maybe one opportunity is not, worth pushing because it seems like there's a lot of opportunities so how do you choose the right one so uh that's just a general strategy question and in certain cases you can figure out that of your 18 options these five or six will probably be the most fertile soil we don't advocate trying all 18 but so there is a sort of a thinking process that goes on to narrow it down to the best options. And what we then suggest people to do is to start with a platform and approach that tests those five or six ideas out, not all 18. Test the best five or six ideas out quickly. And you know the, the path of entrepreneurship and the path of innovation is how do you most quickly and cheaply get to the next information event? You are not building a business. You are building a series of experiments. And that mental shift from I'm building this beautiful convertible car to I'm building this little scooter so I can experiment with moving around the city will allow me to learn about how to build a bike, which will allow me to learn to build a motorcycle, which allowed me to build a car, and then allow me to build a beautiful car. Now, most people, when they get up in the morning, in order to get the energy to move forward, the courage to move forward, they have to be working on the beautiful convertible car driving in Monaco. Otherwise, they don't bring the energy to that. What I'm suggesting is that you have to bring the energy to the scooter, the razor scooter that you're pushing by, by your foot. You have to be happy building the small thing and experimenting with these five or six things. Once you see what the data says, you then focus on one of those five or six things and focus and focus. And once that gets liquidity, once that starts working, you will be very surprised at how it bleeds into the rest of the market. But unless you get that white hot center, unless you get that one thing working, that thing you need to focus on, it's very rare for people to um, move, be able to move out. And, um, you know, I gave the example of Fiverr. They started on something very small. And now they're a $10 billion marketplace company. And I don't think many people would have been willing to focus on, I will write your name on a grain of rice for $5. That's what he was selling for the first few years. And most intellectuals, most well-educated people would find that to be beneath them, would be too small. And therefore, they will miss the opportunity to build a $10 billion really interesting marketplace. Right. And, so, so uh, mm. there, there is strategy, but but ultimately it comes down to testing it and then focusing and then growing. Broad, right. narrow, broad. We talk about broad, narrow, broad, but we don't mean eighteen broad. We mean five or six broad, and then narrow, and then broad. Right. And so, uh, I think two lessons for our listeners. One is uh, uh, that uh, you need to test. 
So you need to uh, get to testing your ideas uh, faster. And then the second one is, and I think this is really poignant, poignant and then I leave to you for, for real this time, Freddy, uh, is that you don't, you need to get excited about stupid things sometimes, you know, because you, it starts from a very stupid thing. You know, it starts from two, two entities in a relationship, something that can be scared up and, uh, and grow, and then you can explore the rest of the other flywheels and the other experiences that you can build on top of that. But I, I, I totally, uh, you're totally right. Some people don't get, don't, uh, cannot get excited enough about a simple thing. And I think this is a very good point. And, and, and if you look at all of the great marketplaces, Airbnb, I mean, Poshmark selling used clothes out of somebody's closet. Mm -hmm. Airbnb was, you know, renting an airbed in someone's extra room. It just, that's not what right. they ended up being, but that they had to be excited about it. And they were, they sustained their excitement about something that stupid for three years when nobody would fund them. Right. Big lesson. Sorry, Manfredi, go ahead. Sorry yeah. about that. No, I, don't uh, I absolutely agree with all of that. Uh, having said that, I do potentially want to raise a counterpoint. So I have been involved in a business that kind of got good traction in the delivery space, but then was kind of eaten by the Uber Eats of the world. And actually, I, I heard earlier today, you on a recent podcast talking about how businesses in the right hailing space today, because of multi-tenanting, potentially burn one billion a year. So sometimes you do get the traction, but actually then when you project it, that doesn't really work, right? So how, where do you, how do you factor that in in order not to waste years and billions? So um, I don't have the, the overall answer for how you avoid wasting time. Most things don't work. And we need to acknowledge that when we're trying to do something innovative and something new, that most things won't work. And creating a space in your mind and in your organization for failure is the number one key to making success. And you have to accept that failure. Um, you know, I went for two and a half years at one point in the middle of my career, starting 20 different companies, 20 small companies for two and a half years. And every day we would try five or six experiments. And I had a team of 40 people and every experiment for two and a half years failed. Everyone, it was exhausting. But That's these forty plan. people, these forty people had been put into a, and, and then eventually we came out with a company called GIF, which we raised sixty-eight million dollars for. We came out with a company called Iron Pearl, which we sold to, and eventually, and then we came out with NFX itself from that process. Mm -hmm. And so eventually we had success, but you, we had to sustain the failure. And so if you fail, and and this is one culturally. You know, it's much easier to fail in Silicon Valley than it is in New York. Like New York, New Jersey, Washington, they don't really like failure. And they like failure even less in Europe. Okay. But the, the, the ability to fail is is a cultural thing that that you need to to create so that so that you can get to the big successes if you want to do something innovative. Um, in the case of this ride hailing uh, company that you're talking about. They picked up on a business model that was working. It started to work. And then the icebergs moved in such a way that their path forward was blocked. Okay. But in, in, in other cases, you know, these companies have, have skated through and suddenly, you know, become big just because the plates moved in a different way. And that's really hard to know. Could we have known that Uber Eats would eat them? I don't know. There's a bunch of companies that were acquired by Uber for billions of dollars where the outcome was pretty good. So mm -hmm. it's, 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 it's definitely hard to know. Uh, but I think, uh, you know, you've got to get in the game and, and you've got to give yourself the chance to, to win because sometimes you just get lucky. Like so many companies that were almost dead and then, uh, and then COVID came like Peloton you know, or DoorDash or, mm -hmm. you know, so many companies were, and then, and then, Hey, they got lucky. So look, I think we have to admit that you can't know everything and that a lot of this ends up being fortune. Right. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. so and then having a bias towards action rather than thinking. <laughs> um, and so going more into the detail uh, and a key um, kind of 
lever for success for marketplaces is the ability to um, acquire and attract customers cost efficiently. Now, I remember you saying a while back that the only way to make marketplace works was to create organic slash kind of free uh, customer acquisition strategies. And then this recently shifted in that you know those channels and opportunities are not no longer available. Um, now, what's interesting to me is that actually we're seeing a big kind of unbundling of social media. Do you think that the pendulum might swing back? Yeah. And what are the, have you seen any interesting examples? Yeah. So um, the, what, what you're referring to, we've got a chart on, on the site. I forget which article it's attached to, but it basically shows the, how viral things were between 2002 and today. And that at various times, there were different platforms which would allow you to get free user acquisition, uh, particularly on the consumer side. <clears throat> and those peaked sort of in 2012 and has been coming down precipitously since then as all the major platforms have figured out that they can put a toll in the form of ads on their systems to capture the value of the traffic that they're sending to startups that we invest in or that we build. And it's come down in sort of a sad way and, and uh, because it was so much fun before to wake up one day and have 250,000 new users of your product for free. And we did that repeatedly. We, we helped design and build products that did that repeatedly. And mm -hmm. we still work with people on these viral flows. And, and um, they still work to some extent. But they don't work at 2.0, meaning you're doubling every day. They'll work at sort of 0 0.4, 0 0.5. And, but that lowers your CAC by half in many cases. So it's worth, it's worth doing. Um, so could we be getting to a new age where we're going to start seeing uh, new viral platforms to get free user growth. Yes, uh, Snap uh, in, is leaving their channels more open than Facebook is leaving their channels open. Um, Clubhouse, as it grows, is now 10 million people or so. That's now a place to go get people. And Clubhouse is very busy growing. They're not busy putting a toll on it yet, but they will you know, in two or three years. But for now, there's an opportunity to maybe go get traffic over there. Um, so yeah, there should be more opportunities as more platforms emerge and they're busy during the first and second and third phases of their growth before they get to the fourth stage, which is monetization. Right. Uh, maybe one question that, that I had, uh, James, uh, um, you know, again, uh, related to the changing landscape, you know, so, um, we used to, to to the consideration that these new type of business um, businesses uh, they really generate the right value when they grow and also when the network effects kick in. And a recurring question, and I also spotted this in the in the YouTube channel, uh, is really how do you reconcile uh, the need to grow with the need to validate your assumptions? Because to some extent, you know, there is this friction. Your assumption cannot be validated if you don't grow. And if you don't validate your assumption, you cannot grow. So how do you crack this code, especially in, uh, in light of how the market is changing? You know, because now we are seeing probably spaces where the product side, the single user value, if you want, or the single player mode, as some, someone calls it, is more important. So. Uh, is this, uh, uh, let's say, equilibrium between this relationship between the value you generate from network effects and the value you generate from the, uh, you know, more simply um, uh, product value proposition changing a little bit as we go more into verticals? How do you, would you suggest to the, our, you know, listeners to approach this issue? Yeah, yeah, it's a good question. So I want to make a distinction between viral growth which is new users for free from your existing users and network effects. They are not the same thing. In fact, there's an article on our website called viral effects are not network effects. I had to write a whole article about this because this comes up all the time. Network effects are about defensibility, about creating value through having more people using it so that no one ever wants to leave. There's really no other alternative. Okay. That's network effects. That's defensibility. That's value. Viral is, just growth, it's free growth, basically. And then there's lots of other ways to grow, but that's free growth, but they're not the same thing. Can you get things that have network effects viral? Yes, happens all the time. And companies like Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter are both a network effect business and viral businesses. 
And so we have confused them because so many of our examples had both. But there are lots of companies that just have network effects and no viral growth, and some companies that have a lot of viral growth and no network effects. So we have to we have to separate those two things. And the point you bring up about you have to grow, but you also have to validate the business is, is exactly right and really critical for founders and project people to understand, uh, particularly in the light of funding. So a lot of people come to me and they say, James, what's the right answer for this question? And often I say, it depends on how much money you have in the bank. And that seems like a very uh, weird answer, but it's true. How you are going to move is going to depend. That's you know on how on how much money you have in the bank, and getting that money in the bank is going to be dependent on whether you can show the business model working to the people who are funding that versus people who are funding growth. And there might be different people. It might be the same people who you know flip flop between the two. But wherever your money source is, if they want to see the the growth going and really exploding, and that's what they're investing in, then do that so that you can get the capital to then go prove the business model or pivot. Or if someone wants to see the, the, the actual metrics, the unit economics working, then make that work and then say, give me the money so I can go grow. But um, in general, I use the analogy of those little toys where the monkeys and you pull the string and the arms go up and the arms, the distance between the hands doesn't move. It's, it's fixed. But you can make the monkey move up by pulling on each of the string. And so sometimes you have to grow enough to have enough people to prove the unit economics. And then once you do that, then you have to um, you know, make the unit economics better so it looks like a really good business. And then you grow some more. And, and so that's how you move these, these marketplace businesses up, like this little monkey on the string. Mm. Um, that's, that's the analogy I use. So that that could be. Can we say that uh, maybe it's, uh, maybe I'm forcing it, but uh, can we say that uh, at the early stage maybe you can you should also focus on the single user or in general the value proposition that can be delivered even without necessarily big growth uh, and and maybe this can help you appeal a certain type of investors and then if you really have a design that can generate broader value in the longer term as the growth network effect kicks in, then you can really target maybe another type of investor where you would need probably more capital not to build this, uh, this growth. Yeah, yeah, that can work. That can work. There's a company in Barcelona called the Hotels Network. And mm -hmm. they call themselves the Hotels Network because they eventually want to be a network of all the independent hotels and then have consumers... And, and business people buy through them at a discount to get to all these boutique hotels. And they had to start out, just as you say, with the single user experience for the single hotel to optimize their sales. And they've started, and it's, you know, I don't know, I don't know how many people there are now. It's like 100 people and they're profitable and they're doing great. And they will eventually turn on the network. But they had to name themselves the network five years ago But then they spent five or six years like OpenTable building out SaaS software and then opening up the network. That, that can work for sure. Mm -hmm. it, it doesn't mean it's always the right choice. Oh, and sure, of course. It's just that, that that is definitely a way to go. And, do you see, and then maybe, Manfredi, you can touch upon the unit economics, but before mm -hmm. that, do you see any alternative pattern coming, coming up? And this seems to be a pattern. What is another maybe leading pattern that you can think about in, in this process? I'm sorry, a leading partner? Pattern, sorry, pattern. pattern. Oh, leading pattern. Um, a leading pattern. Um, I mean, alternative to single user value and then network effects. You know? So anything else that you have seen? Oh, yeah, um, I mean, so look, I mean, there's a company called Outdoorsy, <clears throat> which is the Airbnb for RVs. And... They originally were trying to make a marketplace between individual owners of RVs and individual buyers of RVs, right? And that was hard. It wasn't really working. And so what, when we invested, we said, look, <clears throat> let's focus on building a SaaS tool for the power sellers. Because in many marketplaces, you evolve to power sellers anyway. So maybe let's just start with some power sellers. So I said, 
make a you know a three page a three page document and go out to the small businesses that have 50 to 250 RVs on their lot and show them this piece of paper and say we can give you software to manage your whole business your calendars your payments you know your your maintenance records we can give you SaaS software to run your small business would you ever use this and I said, if eight or nine or 10 of them say they want it, then we're onto something. If one or two or three of them say they want it, then we know it's a bad idea. And if four or five or six say it, then we're not going to be sure. We'll have to try again. And they came back and they said nine of 10 said they would want it. I said, so let's build it. So they built this SaaS software. They gave it to the mom and pops and they onboarded 250 RVs every time onto the platform. Right. And then all the buyers could see it. And so they really focused on that for the first two years, and that gave them the supply to get liquidity on the demand side. And now they've really been focusing on the demand side, and the company's growing like gangbusters. Right, right, right. So it seems like a really an important pattern also to spot. So, Manfred, I'll leave it to you to maybe explore uh, uh, the, the unit economics question, and then maybe we'll have a few minutes of uh, questions from the audience. Sure. So first thing, I guess people come to you saying we have network effects. Taking a data-driven approach, how do you say yes or no when you measure it? What, how do you measure network effects? It's a great question. I would say that we are very early in the science behind measuring network effects. And we haven't found a need to make it extremely precise. Because particularly at the early, like, I think you might want to make it very precise if you are a public market investor deciding on Facebook or deciding mm -hmm. on PayPal. But when you're at the earliest stages of projects or of startups, you kind of know it when you see it. <clears throat> and <clears throat> a couple things that you see are um, what percentage of items listed or services listed get sold? What percentage of uh, people who are selling stay on the platform? What percentage of people who are buying come back? Okay. Mm -hmm. um, there's, there's probably, I don't know, 25 different metrics that we look at. Any group of three or four of them could indicate that something is starting to happen in the community. Mm -hmm. um, you know, I remember when I was, I got on Clubhouse, I think I was like the 800th person on Clubhouse. You could already see with 800 people that something was mm -hmm. happening, right? You found yourself checking in every night and getting on and talking with people and, and you could feel it, you could see it. Could mm -hmm. I measure it? Yeah, I probably could have. Do I need to measure it to understand whether to invest in it or not? If I'm a founder, do I need to measure it in order to decide whether to get up the next morning and keep working on this project or not? Not really. It's kind of it's kind of binary. Mm -hmm. Makes sense. And my last question would be: so ultimately, I see the growth function as a process, a bit like agile, uh, that kind of works throughout the company and optimizes ultimately one um, equation, which is the one relationship between two metrics, CAC versus L, lifetime value. We spoke about CAC before, lifetime value, how does one increase it from a kind of well, both tactical but potentially also strategic perspective? Yeah, yeah, so many ways, so many ways. I mean, um, you know, the, the science of pricing is actually a really fun game, figuring out how to break up, you know, how people pay for something, where the fees are. eBay charges 3.75% transaction fee. But because of all the extra fees, on average, they make 12.5% rake in their marketplace by adding on the extra fees. Um, uh, you know, developing power seller tools. So Amazon has been working on their marketplace. eBay was working on their power seller tools sort of 2010 through 2008 really improved eBay's business. And now Amazon did an even better job of it. So people have migrated to the Amazon marketplace platform because they just have better power tools. You know, they have better SaaS tools 
to embed mm -hmm. in my small business so that when I get up in the morning, I choose to sell on Amazon, not on Etsy. I choose to sell on Amazon, not on Shopify. Okay. So by getting more of my business through Amazon, they just keep making more money. Um, yeah. So they're, they're, through pricing, through power tools, through, I mean, uh, through fintech, adding fintech products, particularly in marketplaces. If you could do, that. you could do insurance. You can do vendor financing. You can do inventory financing. You can do marketing spend financing. So many different right. fintech products can be added on top of these marketplaces to increase your. A lot of these business to business businesses we look at are really just excuses to sell fintech products. You know, they create the marketplace. They they embed the SaaS into the businesses. But the problem with business to business marketplaces is that everybody is trying to get the same thing. Sellers trying mm -hmm. to get margin, the buyers trying to get margin, and the marketplace is trying to get margin. You see, the nice thing about business to consumer is that the consumers just want selection and convenience. And they don't really care if it's $26 or $32. But mm -hmm. they, but but the seller cares about their margin in the marketplace. So then there's only two people competing for margin. So it's easier than having all three compete. So really to get into a business to business marketplace, you really kind of have to pull your rake to pull your margin back down and then make money in other services that sit on top. Mm -hmm. of it. Yeah. And actually, I guess we've kind of inherited from Asian tech companies, the playbook where kind of FinTech is added on top and other services that are added on top. And we've seen Asian companies do that better than US companies. Is that fair to say? I mean, companies um, like Tencent and uh, Grab. I don't know if they've done better than than Western companies. I don't know that their market caps are bigger, but um, they certainly have grown very quickly. Um, mm -hmm. You know, they, there's a speed and voraciousness level that exists over in China in particular that exceeds what we see in the U.S., and certainly more than what we see in, in Europe. Um, and a lot of, you know, they, they do work six days a week and they do work nine to 14 hours a day. Like it's just a, it's a different culture. And so you end up with, with these incredible speed spikes um, with essentially, you know, the same types of businesses that they are evolving mm -hmm. in the ecosystem. Right. Right. So, so maybe if I can wrap up this question, uh, which is, I think a very interesting, very important, uh, uh, when uh, we think about marketplace, we seem to think too much about the take rate while you are telling us, you know, you need to look at all the other pieces that you can add on top of your pricing story. So maybe pricing and monetization is becoming a topic to explore a bit more um, specifically, you know, as the industry matures, because, you know, so far it's been, everything has been like, you know, this is your take rate, the, your CAC, your you know uh, customer lifetime value that's it it needs to fit but you know apparently as you're saying we need to be more uh, inventive about monetization and plugging things up and and uh, making more um, nuanced pricing and monetization strategies right yeah absolutely and, and that's just tactics that's just experimenting and talking to your customer if i sold you you know five hundred dollars a month in SaaS, would you pay it and then you don't have to pay any transaction fees yeah i would pay it okay well, on the supply, on the buying side, then we just have them pay SaaS fees. And on the supply side, we charge them a rake. So, you know, different marketplaces are going to go different. Look, the thing with marketplaces is that the biggest challenge is behavior change. Just as we go into large corporations and we say, how do we get behavior change? How do we do corporate renewal? It's hard. People's brains don't adapt. They don't want to change their behavior, blah, blah. When you come into a marketplace, it's like a giant corporation. It's just a network. A corporation is a network and a marketplace is just a network. It has its patterns. It has its culture. It has its language and it doesn't want to change. So the marketplace comes in like a change agent in the corporation into the market and says, will you change by using this, by doing this? And you have to go in and convince every person, just like in a, co in a corporate change, environment, you have to convince every player that it's in their best interest to do this new thing. And right. that's why marketplaces often take six, seven, eight years to get going is because it's a change process for people. Not right. because the technology doesn't work, not because price discovery isn't better. Not All those things are in place from day one. It just takes the people a long time to change their behavior. Mm -hmm. Right, because uh, it's essentially a change in uh, 
the firm uh, uh, structure. No? You move from the industrial one-to-one -one relationship, you are the consumer, I'm the producer, into these trust-based relational systems you know, that, uh, that need really to change the approach how you, you get things done. So maybe since we are entering the last 15, 10, 15 minutes of the conversation, uh, let's, keep, let's pick a couple of questions from the audience. And I think one speci specifically was very interesting because as we talk with you, uh, I feel like uh, on one hand, you are, you are the one that probably among each uh, any, anyone else in the world, uh, you have been the one trying to explain that this is a science, you know, to some extent. You need to really do your study your way through, through this and test and, and so on. But the more we speak, the more I understand that it's also a cultural element. You know, it's also uh, uh, really important how do you feel things, you know, to some extent, as you said. So um, my question would be, if you think about the team, building the team uh, for these initial stages, what are the skills that these teams need to really have uh, to, to find, you know, to navigate their way through validation, early growth, uh, pricing exploration, and, and so on? What would you suggest? Yeah, two things I can say that might resonate with people. <clears throat> One, so, so you're absolutely right. We talk a lot about uh, concepts and language and breaking things down so you know what you're looking at. So we break down it to 15 network effects and different types of defensibilities. We give people language to know what they're looking at. We haven't gone into the science of exactly measuring it because just knowing what you're looking at is enough. <laughs> you know, it, it, it's not worth the extra time to, to get further than that in 2021. Maybe in 2045, we'll need to go there. But right now, we don't need to. We also talk a lot about psychology and culture, OK? We, a lot of the, the, the articles you'll see I'm writing are have the word psychology in it. Because you're right. It's so much about the, the, the culture and the psychology of the individual. And um, we, we, those are the two barbells that, that make these things work. And, um, uh, and and go back to your question again. You want me to reconcile what? To, to uh, how would you build the team? And also maybe okay. what kind of skills so, and, and here's, here's what it, so here's what it leads to. It's for, for startups and things where you're doing innovation, the personality and the approach is much more important than the skills. And the personality, the, the, the framework we use is we say there are three types of people, commandos, soldiers, and police. The commandos do anything that's required. They're crazy. They don't have any fear. They move to the fast moving water. They're nuts. They get stuff done today by lunch. It's done. The soldiers, they come in and build floating bridges, dirt roads. They put in some electricity, right? Some mobile homes are there. Structure. And the police are there. Once civilization has been established, they are there only to make sure nothing bad happens. And so they help make sure nothing happens, right? When you're trying to have a party, they come by and they say, hey, there's been complaints. You need to stop your party. And you're like, all right. When you're doing innovation work, particularly around startups or innovative products inside of corporations, you really only want commandos. And if you find yourself with a police person, you really need to get them the hell out of there. And if you find yourself with a soldier, you probably need to get them out of there pretty quickly as well. You really just need commandos. That's the personality type that tends to find a way to iterate, to experiment. And people ask me, if I've got a soldier, can I teach them to be a commando? And after 25 years of doing this, I'm afraid the answer is no, you can't. They really need to go work somewhere else. So that's the first thing I would say. Be a commando, find commandos. Now, a lot of people look at startups and say, oh, what a wonderful lifestyle, and I want to make a billion dollars, and yada, yada, yada. But they're not commandos. And they want, the, 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 they want to be Mark Zuckerberg. They want to be Sergey and Larry, but they're not commandos. And so they're never going to get there. And... Uh, and so what they should do is go find a company that already has 100 people, get 0.1% of the company, and then have that company be worth $10 billion. They'll make their $10 million 
by doing that once we need soldiers into the organization, okay? So that's the first thing. And then the second thing I'll say is when it comes to growth, when we started figuring out all the viral techniques back in 2000, 2004, we assumed everyone would learn them by 2006 or seven. So we started trying to learn something new because we figured, oh, this is gonna be known by everyone. We have been very surprised at how few people, even if you teach them everything, can actually pull it off. The number of people who understand both data and language are very few. You wanna look for the person in your organization who understands language and also loves data. Very few people are like that. They're just not born that way. When you find that person, make them in charge of growth, right? So we would spend Saturday morning just looking through data because we love the data. We would just be running SQL queries to find out what, what was moving, what was happening inside the mechanism of the marketplace so that we could then start innovating on the products. We would then make lists of 80 or 90 different phrases that we would then put into A-B testing. We would come up with the phrases, we'd write them on the whiteboard. We had so much fun with the language and with the data. And we didn't realize how unique that was. So when you look for a head of growth, look for those two characteristics. And we've got a podcast uh, with uh, Josh Elman where we talk about this. Uh, Josh has been at Facebook and LinkedIn and Twitter and Greylock and Robin Hood. And you know, he's one of the great uh, growth guys uh, in the Valley. And, and he and I are old friends and have worked on many projects together. And he and I have a conversation about what makes for great growth his name is Josh Elman, and um, and it's a growth thing on NFX, the podcast. Right, right. Now, Freddy, if you have one last uh, question, because I have the last one for James before we break, but I will leave it to you. Maybe if you have some last point that you want to ask. Um, so the I think that it's actually about that. Um, so kind of combining the quantitative and qualitative aspect of a growth team. And, and so I guess when you do that, effectively you create a capability and also potentially a kind of a data competitive advantage at the same time, right? Um, and so how, I mean, that in itself is quite valuable for companies, right? I mean, is, how, what's like, do you do you invest in that? Would, would you recommend people investing in that? And and also because earlier you, you spoke about kind of defensibility and actually is, is that kind of that in itself a defensibility? Absolutely. Absolutely. If you can build a culture in your team of failure and then of iterating with language and then measuring with data, if you can create that culture, that's very rare. You, if you give me that, if you give me six people or four people who have that culture, I can, I can, I can create a $100 million company in four years. It's right. so rare. It's so rare. There's so many great marketplaces. There's so many. It's just really hard to find those teams. Yeah. So uh, it's not even. A, it's, sorry, it's not even a doctrine problem. It's more like a mindset uh, and, uh, and like skills. DNA problem. You know that you need to be able to be passionate about data on one hand and tell the story on the other hand, so that you can iterate on that. Yeah, and those people, those people, when I meet them, they're pretty obvious. So I was, I was in. Uh, and if you go back to uh, YouTube, you'll see a, a talk I gave at Le Web in 2013 on growth. And uh, I was living in Switzerland. So I went over to Israel and I met 45 companies. And this one guy I met had this characteristic. His name was Ben Rubin. I was like, Ben, you got to move to the valley. And, you know, I'll help you build your, your big network. And so he came and, and we worked every week. And I worked with him and his team. And he had, you know, six guys. And... We then tried one thing. It didn't work. He said, okay, fine. We give up, James. How do we do this? I said, let's, and I, and I ran them through a process and we came up with a bunch of ideas and he just started executing each of those ideas. The first idea was Meerkat. The second idea was House Party. Hmm. And he was successful with Meerkat and then Twitter shut them down. And then he was successful with House Party. Um, you know, and then it became like the number one app during COVID. And, so it's not that he had the multi-billion dollar exit, but he was such a unique person 
that I knew that he could do this repeatedly. And if you look at Paul Davison, mm -hmm. who's done Clubhouse, I worked with him on Highlight, which was uh, South by Southwest Sweetheart. And then he did Roll, which I worked with him on. And now he's doing Clubhouse. And he and I have talked about all the features of Clubhouse and how it's going to roll out. And we're small investors in it. And, you know, um, he, Paul is a unique person who can do this repeatedly because he has the mentality, he has the, 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 the approach. So, uh, it, it, it really takes unique talent and much, much like Hollywood, right? Like there's lots of sitcoms, there's lots of, but Jerry Seinfeld is just special. Right. You know? Um, and it's the same thing with a lot of these social networks and a little bit less so for marketplaces. You don't have to be that special to do a marketplace, but you, you still have to have that, that cultural thing to, mm. to iterate, to get it. That's it. So James, for as a closing point, maybe uh, if you have still two minutes more, um, last time we had you on the podcast, you told me, you know, look into the everything that is happening around work, uh, marketplaces around work, uh, professionals and so on. So that was uh, indeed uh, this year, this has been uh, fairly uh, a ride. You know, we have seen so many innovations and, you know, in the world of designers, for example, with the new features of Figma or other marketplaces with regards to hiring and so on. So what is now at the moment that excites you? What you uh, would suggest to our um, listeners to keep an eye on in terms of new space opening up for, for, for uh, marketplaces and for new propositions? Look, I still think there's a lot to do with labor marketplaces. Uh, I think there's a lot to do on B2B. You know, B2B is just beginning. And, uh, you know, the people who are now taking over businesses are now 40. They're taking it over from their parents or whatever. And they grew up with email, at least. So they're not digital native, but they at least understand email and they do everything digitally. And so they are going to be allowing the, the behavioral change is taking place generationally. And so now B2B marketplaces can actually flourish. And so we're seeing a lot more there. Um, uh, you know, we're seeing a lot of marketplaces in LATAM, right? So in mm -hmm. places where you haven't seen these things grow before, they're now starting to grow there. Uh, so geographically, you're seeing a shift. Um, what else? Um, you know, r just recently, you've seen this, uh, you know, what's a new thing to trade? on a marketplace, NFTs, non-fungible tokens. You know, I think one marketplace did $250 million of transactions last week alone. Like it's come out of nowhere in the last right. six weeks. You know, and it's not out of nowhere. I mean, we've been looking at this for three, four years, um, but it just took off recently. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, that's, that's a new thing. I mean, I think the whole crypto thing is going to create new modalities of transactions. It's going to create new things to transact. For instance, you could create an NFT for real estate and start transacting those. An NFT for derivatives. You could create an NFT for, for Goldman Sachs derivatives and start trading those. I mean, you're just going to see a lot of flowering in the fintech space around crypto, around marketplaces mm -hmm. as new things come into being, like tracking stocks, NFT tracking stocks for Tesla stock. You could start trading, you know, it, the, the, yeah, there's a lot going on in the fintech area. Right. James, let's uh, let's uh, stop here. I will go forever, but uh, you have, uh, I'm sure, a long day still. So let me just uh, use uh, um, one minute to uh, share with our listeners uh, the uh, next steps. So basically look out for... Uh, uh, the next uh, blog post and then uh, two more webinars, even three probably before June and uh, keep, a, uh, keep an eye on our new growth guide and the training sessions we're going to uh, offer probably in, in July. So uh, keep an eye on that. Um, uh, if you want to subscribe, go to uh, http platform.com growth uh, dot um grow to subscribe and that's pretty much everything i mean uh james uh thanks very much it's so enriching all the time to speak with you you are so poignant always uh, i think uh, the listeners will have uh, 
lots of food for thought uh, in the in the uh, next weeks to to think about. And of course, uh, maybe reach to reach out to you hopefully with some good business ideas. You have this also. You also have building a platform around NFX, you know, to be able to uh, get more founders. So I don't know. Maybe you want to say a couple of words on how to uh, reach to reach out to yeah, NFX. So we have um, we have two products that we put out there to help the ecosystem do better. One of them is Signal. Signal.nfx.com is a platform where you can find out about all sorts of investors. Um, we're in there too, but we're only you know four partners out of ten thousand people who are there but we want you to be able to find the right investor for you. And so we've created Signal for that. Um, and, you know, I don't know, 80,000 founders a, a, a month use it. It's, it's very useful. And, um, and then we've also built a thing called The Company Brief. Thecompanybrief.com is where you go and you create a, a company brief. It's, it's like a doc send just for startups. And it's the best way to show your business to uh, a VC or any investor because it has the deck, it has 16 important questions that all investors need to know answered, and then you pull that information out. And it's a very good exercise for you as a founder to think through how you wanna present it. And it lets you put up a video of yourself. So you essentially have a first meeting with an investor just by sending them the private link to your brief. And when they look at it, you can track them. Okay, so you get the information advantage over the investor by being able to track them. And, uh, it allows you to take the meetings with the, the ones that are right for you. The, the problem for the VCs is that they get these intros or you email them and they don't really understand the greatness of your business. So to reduce that, and so they don't take a meeting. Uh -huh. To reduce that risk, you wanna send them a company brief so that they'll actually take the meeting. They'll get the genius and the greatness of your business. It, it, it helps you to show what, what's happening. I, I have a friend who got introduced to Robin Hood years ago and he just didn't even take the meeting because the, the intro email was so bad. If the intro email had been bad, but it had a company brief link, he could have clicked through and he'd been like, ah, actually, this is kind of interesting. I'll take the meeting. And he might have invested in a, a multi-billion dollar company. Thank you, James. Uh, thank you, Manfredi. And thanks to our listeners.